Hi everybody. Recently, we've been covering the rise of psychedelic capitalism, and there have been some huge developments in the last few weeks. So this is really important for the future of psychedelic medicine, but it's also a microcosm for what happens when any utopian vision clashes with existing market forces. If you're not playing the game, the game is playing you. And, and it feels to me that a number of really well-intentioned folks are belatedly realizing we're in the late stages of a chess game. And oh shit, there's only three moves left on the board and I'm stitched up. Most of the controversy centers on a big company called Compass Pathways. And it all started when a Vice article revealed that they're attempting to patent universal aspects of psychedelic therapy. So things like patients listening to music or the therapy room having soft furniture or even therapists touching a patient's shoulder. It caused outrage in the psychedelic community. And it reached a new level when Tim Ferriss, the celebrity podcaster who's been a huge supporter and investor in psychedelic research, started to draw attention to it. And there's more. Oregon has been on the path to legalizing psilocybin therapy, but new allegations suggest that the head of Compass Pathways has been trying to block this from happening so that they're the only game in town. I've asked Compass Pathways to comment on these allegations and I'll update if and when they respond. To try and make sense of what's happening, I spoke to Jamie Wheel, best-selling author and an outspoken critic of the way psychedelics are going mainstream. We talked about what happens when well-meaning people get swept up by the market. And it feels like we're, we're pretty damn close to a stitch up at this point by the players who have been playing the transactional game at the lowest levels of the board, which is fundamentally legal and forcible you know, property and control. And for many people in the psychedelic renaissance, um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of well-intentioned naivety on a number of the players. We also talked about why we need to understand the deeper dynamics at play. And I think one of the most relevant for this situation is um, the notion of the multipolar trap, which is just the simplest way to say it is if somebody's definitely gonna be a dick, it might as well be me. And so that's where the whole thing of like, I've looked into their eyes, I've seen their soul, we've broken bread, we've tripped for a night, right? They've told me their profound journey story, which brought them to this space, right? All that, that, those things go out the fucking window, right? When we have the multipolar trap. And also what happens when new players enter the psychedelic space for the wrong reasons? What we're seeing in the piling into psychedelic wellness, psychedelic coaching, medicine retreats, all of these things is a bunch of fuckwits coming into a business. They have no de depth or understanding. I mean, it's like if you, if you first came across ayahuasca from a fucking podcast, you know, and now you're holding anything to do with it from the, from the leadership side, you know, just fuck off. So here's the full interview. Jamie, it's really good to, to have you back on Rebel Wisdom. And you were kind of the first person I wanted to speak to following the recent developments in, I guess, what's now called the psychedelic industry or the psychedelic field. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose to catch people up, you know, we've been covering the, the kind of rise of psychedelic capitalism and the, the various concerns that people have around that on the channel. And recently, it's, I think it's really ramped up. And I wanted to ask you, so about two years ago on the channel, you said, um, about this, about the psychedelic renaissance. We thought we were getting Woodstock. Uh, we're getting Prozac Nation 2.0. It's two years on from that. Um, how do you feel now? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's thin gruel. You know, I mean, there, there's no satisfaction in seeing any of these things play out the way you think they might. Um, but when we've got such well-worn grooves, um, both in culture, but also specifically in sort of tort law <laughs> and, and, and le you know, legal reinforcement of certain, certain default behaviors, it's very, very hard to get out of those ruts. You know, the sort of the gutter ball waits for us all. <laughs> and, and, and figuring that out is, is critical because, you know, I, think, I, I don't know who said this, but it's basically <laughs> that the riff is if you're not playing the game, the game is playing you. And, and it feels to me that a number of really well-intentioned folks, and this ranges from academic researchers to clinicians and therapists to hopeful patients, um, to just anybody who is sort of an advocate for social change, um, are belatedly realizing we're in the late stages of a chess game. <laughs> and and, and, the, and the, you're like, oh, I didn't even know we were playing checkers, let alone 
multidimensional chess and oh shit, there's only three moves left on the board and I'm stitched up. Mm. And, and it feels like we're, we're pretty damn close to a stitch up at this point by the players who have been playing the transactional game at the lowest levels of the board, which is fundamentally legal enforceable you know, property and control. And for many people in the psychedelic renaissance, um, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of well-intentioned naivety on a number of the players. So if you say, Hey, you know, academics are notoriously unworldly. It's why they clambered on up into the ivory tower in the first place. Uh, there is a degree of purity of thought, purity of research, integrity of data, that idea that, you know, they're, they're hundred percent and, and wonderfully so bought into the notion of the scientific method and meritocratic information and truth. And so, so those folks are not always well conditioned to understand the market, the, the market adjacencies and the, the sort of gravitational pulls of venture capital, of big pharma, of, you know, of IP and IP protection, of funding and funding with string, with and without strings, um, all of those kinds of things. You also have what you could call the sort of the psychedelic old guard. So predominantly baby boomers, there's obviously been a, there's been a very strong conversation in the uh, concentration in the San Francisco Bay area, but lots of other nodes around the world. And those are the folks that were participants in the 60s to 70s and on, and kind of were the torchbearers of keeping this light going through the Reagan years and, and beyond. And, and they're sort of holding forth of like, oh, wow, now is, now is the sort of second wave and we are the stewards. And in summer, and they too, they bless their hearts, right? They, they were formed in the, in the countercultural transformational underground of which the, the ineffability, ineffability of the experience, the kind of the Gnostic nature of it, the connection to expansive and anti-competitive, you know, peace, love, and happiness ideals are, are, are central to their relationship to these compounds. And you, know, you, and you can take Rick Doblin and the work at MAPS as this, you know, as a really fascinating kind of case study in transition between these worlds as they've been trying to navigate, how do we take this from countercultural underground, above board to, to federally approved and sanctioned? And then how do, we, how do we chart a path through all of these different worlds? Because the, the other population that we haven't mentioned, right? we've got naive academics, we've got naive um, torchbearers, from the prior from the prior generation and then we've got decidedly non-naive venture capital and corporate engagement and 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 into that mix the only the the two that don't know that their the game is playing them are the folks that are actually trying to hold the integrity and the spirit of this movement mm. So that's just kind of, I mean, that's just an initial setup. And, and there are other players. There are, there are well-intentioned folks in the corporatization space. There are bad actors in the, or, or, or burnouts in, in, the old, in the old guard, right? There's, also, there's a mixed bag, but in general, I would just say that a number of the folks that are closest to this movement and are potentially trying to hold it with the most care and concern um, may not be fully aware of all the drivers and dynamics. And I think Tim's, Tim's recent um, comments, right, about within his Twitter post and that kind of stuff was like, hey, to, to Christian was like, hey, I know you guys. I believe you to be good people, right? And somehow I think bad things still might happen. And I think that is kind of the essential bit when I'm speaking of this naivety, right? You, you could have somebody from the old guy be like, well, we know that they've had profound personal transformative experiences. They, that, that's what they sat down and shared with us across a table, or maybe even we've shared psychedelic spaces. So we know the measure of the person we've seen, you know, we've looked into their eyes, we've seen their soul, kind of George Bush 101, right? And, and yet, and it's that, and yet, that I think is the key thing we, we you know, sort of look more closely at and try to. Yeah, I would love to delve into that because, you know, I, I, this idea of different people playing different games and and also game theory and how money changes the game you know it just makes me think i have a lot of friends i love very much but when i play monopoly with them i hate them for a while <laughs> because monopoly <laughs> makes you act like a dick and so th there is you know i'd love to delve into that like how 
how the how the money changes the game because there was no money in psychedelics. Um, there, it just was not a thing. I mean, even when I was getting into it, like you know, as a like twenty year old, uh, it was like, oh, you, the, the idea that you would make money out of psychedelics was uh, absurd. And this year in particular, it's like, uh, and spending a bit of time on Clubhouse, it seems that every every life coach has smelling something and every psychologist who's feeling a bit bored, you know, sees an opportunity, which is fine. It's an exciting field, but it also, it gets very messy with the introduction of money. So I'd love to talk a little bit about, yeah, hear your thoughts on game theory and how that all ties together. For sure. And then also let's put a map on life, life coaches, functional medicine, doctors, et cetera. Cause our, our uh, friend and colleague, Matt Johnson at Hopkins has recently published a piece on some of the perils of the projecting of worldviews and other things into the psychedelic space, which is a, which is not the market mechanic stuff, but it's another critical issue right now. So I'd love to be able to circle back to that one. But as far as the, the game theory dynamics, I mean, this is not, um, especially complicated, right? And uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger and Jordan Hall and, and, and lots of others have, have done some brilliant kind of passing of the way game theory shows up in social dynamics. And, and I think one of the most relevant for this situation is um, the notion of the multipolar trap, which is just the simplest way to say it is if somebody's definitely going to be a dick, it might as well be me. So that, you know, and basically what it ends up doing is trashing the commons. So if there is a non-zero chance or even a high probability that someone is going to grab the last brownie for sure, then I will, because somebody's going to, somebody's going to, you know, break the commons. Someone's going to break the norm and it might as well be me. And you see this with, you know, Chinese fishing fleets. You see this with lumber harvesting. You see this with, you know, all sorts of very real world ecological issues can i can we you know the mercantilism of european colonialism right like, like go grab it now and otherwise someone else will and what that does is that creates because of that logic it drives good people to a sociopathic conclusion not because they are actually sociopaths themselves but they have they have decent evidence right, on behalf of their stakeholders, that someone else is a sociopath. Therefore, we, we must for rational self-preservation. And so that's where the whole thing of like, I've looked into their eyes, I've seen their soul, we've broken bread, we've tripped for a night, right? They've told me their profound journey story, which brought them to this space, right? That, all those things go out the fucking window, right? When we have the multipolar trap. And, and as an example, I mean, one that was very alive for me because, um, you know, I live in Austin, Texas. That's the, the home, that's the headquarters of Whole Foods. And I've, you know, got to know John Mackey in various um, capacities around the conscious capitalism movement over the last decade. And so, the, um, so the ability, you know, seeing Whole Foods and, and, and you can love or hate John's politics, but I don't think anyone can question that he is iconoclastic as fuck does precisely what he believes is the right thing to do, what regardless of PR, and had played an overwhelming role in being a market mover for global organic agriculture, produce development, et cetera. But, right, and this goes, this, and we can circle back to this because I think um, one of the Atai you know, comments in the, in the dialogue with Tim was sort of the notion of, oh, the only way to create scale and growth is via capitalization of markets, right? So Whole Foods, became a public company, looked to expand their reach, more organic farmers doing more good things, yay, 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 but public company. And then you suddenly had, and folks may not know this backstory, right? I mean, you might've just seen the headline, oh, Amazon sells, you know, or Amazon buys Whole Foods. But what actually happened was that Jana Funds took over 8% of the public stock and became an activist investor and said, hey, all this do-gooder shit you guys are doing, unconscionable from a shareholder value, we're actually gonna sue you, put pressure on you and actually force you to, you know, potentially swap out Mackey as the CEO, strip out the inefficiencies, which are always the pro-social and pro-human things, right? And if you don't, we're going to cripple you. And so, the, so, so it was the devil they knew versus the devil they didn't. It was a forced pressure sale to Amazon which, the, you know, of course, the press clippings are all like, we're so happy for the synergies and the overall alignment and this and that. And, 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 you know, and basically, Amazon has just been a slow moving anaconda, just coiling Whole Foods and just squeezing out all the inefficiencies. And suddenly you end up with Whole Foods just being organic Walmart for yuppies. 
right? And, th- and that's in spite of, you know, a test case of Mackey being one of the least flinching, least willing, least, least subject to bend off his principles and values, right, of any CEO you could imagine. So now dump that, you know, cascade that down into the psychedelic renaissance. And we start seeing, you, you just, we ought to expect <laughs> not dissimilar dynamics. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really nice example. And, and actually, you know, makes me think of, of, we will call it Pala, which if people haven't checked that out, definitely should the short story released by the Oren Project. And, and it really is a story of uh, very small compromises over time leading to completely losing the dream. And I think that, you know, considering the popularity of that story, um, you know, I, I'm surprised there isn't, uh, there is, to be fair, actually quite a lot of pushback right now on this, uh, on the kind of psychedelic capital. But so just, just to circle back to something you, you mentioned about sort of academics, right? Because right now it's really the academics who are in the driving seat of, um, let's say mainstream credibility and, and mainstreaming in general. And actually in, in Tim Ferriss's response to Christian Angermeyer, he asked a question of, um, you know, would you be willing to allow scientists who have signed deals with Compass or Atai to share their agreements publicly, i.e. waive confidentiality clauses? Um, uh, and if not, why not? And I think that's a really good point. And the, the point I've been very curious about as well is flipping it around. You know, I think that is about potentially seeing what they've been asked to agree to. And I know that there's, you know, behind the scenes has been tension about clauses that academics have been asked to agree to. But it also flips around to, you know, what have academics been offered? And I, I, I don't see many people talking about that, you know, because you mentioned there's there's not a whole lot of, um, yeah, I mean, academics don't get always the status they might deserve, but they also don't get the money they deserve. And so there's this whole other flip side of the game, which I'm curious about, which is um, who, you know, if, if someone's offered shares in, in a particular psychedelic pharma company for doing a study, um, uh, you know, that's also something that that ideally ethically needs to be disclosed, but we have no idea necessarily. And so I would want to see both sides disclosing. I haven't been offered any shares. I'm not going to take any shares. And here's what we've asked these academics to do with the data. So I'm curious to hear whether y- your thoughts on that. So again, I mean, I, I think in this instance, it's broadly, <laughs> I think it's great to presume best intent by well-intentioned humans in this situation. Now, I, I think I, there may be a carve out for transactional vulture capitalists, right? <laughs> um, and in and, and which case, you know, we can absolutely call spades where we need to. But to, to take a moment for, um, to just kind of practice some empathy for the researchers, almost all of them, I mean, granted, there's now a gold rush coming in. It's a little bit like Navy SEALs pre and post bin Laden. You know, the ones before were in there as the invisible silent squadrons. And the ones after were like, I want to be a rock star, you know, and be that guy in Call of Duty. And so obviously now it's easy. I want to do psychedelic research. Put me on the wait list at, you know, NYU, Imperial, Hopkins, wherever. Um, But for all of those folks from Robin Carhart Harris to to Matt Johnson in this generation, to the early, to the old guard, Roland Griffiths and others, that was a, that was a thankless path to go down, risking, you know, isolation, alienation, total, utter lack of credibility, possible putting your tenure at risk, all the things, right? And scrounging for research and funding. And then suddenly in this last decade, we've seen that shift and then studies start galloping along. And now we've got what is called the kind of the pollen effect where now even mainstream straight laced folks are like, this is really interesting. This is really respectable. Like it sounds, seems amazing, right? And now you've got, I mean, Robin Carhart Harris was just noted one of time 100's most notable people. You've got psychedelic researchers as public, public intellectual rock stars. It's mind bending. And that acceleration curve is very disorienting. And so, put, you know, to put oneself in their shoes, they took the risk, they dedicated years, they, 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 they rolled the dice on whether they were just blowing up careers. And now everybody wants a piece of them. And now everything that was hard is suddenly excessively easy. And, and funding is, you know, funding is there to be had and potentially, um, and almost always comes with strings. So there are, the, there are the situations of really well-intentioned people who have had profound life-changing experiences or who have suffered great tragedy, some trauma in their life or family or addiction, and just simply believe, and God bless them. And there are others that are coming in and saying, hey, psst, we can make all your dreams come true, and we own the data afterwards, right? Or you've been laboring, for, you know, been, you've been fighting the good fight within a nonprofit, 
taking marginal pay offset by the purpose you believe you're serving. And then suddenly you're aqua hired. Somebody says, hey, how would you like to make four times as much? How would, you know, this is the Walter White conundrum, right? Here's the most amazing lab with all the, all the things and it can be yours. And all you need to do is work for us and make your good shit. And so, so, so artists, you know, most researchers are in some respect, right? They, they, are, they are devotees of their craft. And they're suddenly, A, I can make more money in a year than I have in five or 10. I may have a family. I may have grad school loans. I, you know, I'm a human making choices. And they're, given, they're offered these sweetheart deals and they don't notice the strings in the back or they don't appreciate the implications of the fine print. And they end up becoming in some form of indentured servitude to a corporate machine that hasn't actually fully displayed their, their full intentions or where this goes. This is a little bit like the Jurassic Park scientist, you know, Walter White, Jurassic Park, right? It's so similar. I just wanted to do the pure science. What happened? And then by the time they realize what's happening, want to put on the brakes, they too are stitched up. And so you also see that, you know, there's a loss of human capital. So there's an awful lot of poaching from the long-term um, nonprofit social benefit organizations. Um, and, and their best and brightest are getting picked off. And you're also having a situation where for-profit companies are making lavish overtures at first. And whether that's donations to maps or it's funding certain studies, and they sort of, they're, they're capitalizing on the halo effect of affiliation with these well-known brands in the space. And then, and then, then later they do a pivot. And whether that's changing their corporate entity status from nonprofit to for-profit, whether that's turning into we're going to be the next goop of psychedelics or whatever their, their stands are. And they are somewhat, I think you could make a case, cynically leveraging that and muddying the waters or muddying the optics of affiliation so that other folks will come in and go, well, oh, well, if MAPS is signed off on these guys and your son is here and Hopkins is, there's a little badge or there's a little quote, then these guys must be okay also. But there's a little bit of kind of being led down the garden path to some very different outcomes. Yeah, no, I think it's really, really nicely said. And um, yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, my, my wife is a psychedelic researcher. A lot of my best friends are. And I see them, you know, the, struggling with these ethical issues a lot. Um, and, you know, coming from a place of, of wanting to, um, yeah, genuinely help patients very often. And so, you know, it makes me wonder, you, you use the... The example of Whole Foods, and I think mindfulness, the way mindfulness entered the, the, the mainstream is also a nice example of that. Eric Davis actually spoke to that really well in the, the previous film. And um, yeah, and, and so I'm curious if you've come across any examples of where it doesn't go tits up, because it just seems like all of these, let's say, transformative practices or, or now substances, they enter the existing game and they slowly or sometimes quickly get transformed into like a a paltry version of themselves and they get stripped of the magic. Um, is that inevitable? Like, do we need a completely different system for it to work? Have you seen uh, or, you know, had any thoughts about how it could go better? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's important to note there are really well-intentioned folks trying to thread this needle. Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, Usona is an example. I'm, I'm not deeply familiar with all of their steps and moves, but they appear to be doing the, trying to do the right thing consistently at a number of choice points. Um, I think MAPS is absolutely trying to do the right thing. Now, my question for Rick and, and for everyone involved in the organization is, you know, there are rising critiques of like, hey, are you guys getting kind of hoodwinked by the neoliberal promise here, right? Are, are you, you know, that sense of trying to stay Switzerland and stay neutral and, and support all options is that, you know, basically are the good actors absolutely aligned with you while the bad actors are putting your car up on blocks and stripping the rims and wheels while you're not watching. And in which case, you know, is it too little too late? And, and in general, you know, and even um, MAPS's decisions, for instance, to work with militaries and police forces and all these kind of things, you're like, wait, what side are you on? And taking funding from the Mercers and other, you know, right wing things. And, and, and I, I really respect the path they're attempting to walk, which is to say, if we want this to be out in the world, we, we absolutely can't just be a sort of lefty ghetto. We can't sort of have isolated ourselves off to the side of people who think like us and talk like us. This, If we're trying for scale or transformation, we absolutely have to extend and expand our outreach. Um, but there are questions, right? And, and, and your, your, your notion of um, 
I mean, one, one thinker um, uh, who, who I think has informed Daniel and, and Jordan's work quite a bit as well has, has shared the somewhat depressing maxim of anything that can be weaponized will be. <laughs> right, Tim Wu, who's now just been brought on by, by Biden's team, he wrote the master switch, he coined net neutrality. He has that idea of like any information technology starts out utopian and democratic, ends up hegemonic and centrally controlled. From radios to telegraph to internet to now, you could also make the case of psychedelics as an information technology. It, it sort of follows those trends. So, <clears throat> so my sense is, is, yeah, we're stuffed, right? I mean, even take the organic movement, like, you know, in the US, Horizon was an early very, you know, it, it was a brand of milk, organic milk that blew up. And then suddenly like three, four, five years later, and it's in Costco's and it's at scale. And then suddenly they're like, oh, you've got this nice little Holstein cow with a cartoon of a pretty farm. The realities of industrial organic are far, far grimmer than the stories sold to yuppies, you know, about how it all gets done. And so there's just this sense of like, there's nearly 8 billion of us where we, we've created this capitalist mechanism. And it is just this kind of ruthless, ruthless engine that just grinds everything into um, optimal unit efficiencies. So my sense is, is that the psychedelic renaissance in its utopian democratic thing is dead on arrival. And it has really been since its inception, bless its heart, you know, <laughs> so that we will see that we will call it Pala play. That is inevitable and it's already happening. I mean, even during quarantine, we saw some of the you know, and folks that we were watching, folks that have come to us for, you know, uh, you know, wanted us to be on advisory boards and stuff, and it just didn't quite feel right at the time doing uh, ketamine therapies. And then quarantine happened, and they're like, whoa, 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 well, we've got an investor, we've got timelines, we've got things we got to do. Let's move to telemedicine. Let's start actually having people, let's dose people during quarantine in their homes and be on the phone if they need us. And you're like, you know, like th those, are, those are problematic. And once someone, back to multipolar traps, once someone has said you can have take home ketamine therapy via telemedicine support if you need it, that has stripped out the cost structures of delivering high quality standard of care. And now as an uneducated consumer, and, and maybe, my, maybe I don't have insurance, maybe my insurance doesn't carry support this, and I am now in a price sensitive uneducated consumer, I am going to follow a slick website with all the right testimonials and, and soothing all my fears and like overcoming my objections and press one button to schedule an easy appointment today, that is going to siphon off so many naive patients. And once that's done, now that's the race to the bottom. That's the multipolar trap. And anybody trying to do otherwise is now forced into a different, a different market niche that they may or may not be equipped <clears throat> or informed or resourced to deliver on. Yeah, it just makes me think, you know, we've had uh, chats about this before, and I remember you talking about the, the sort of mystery traditions, you know, and I'm just thinking if we go back to ancient Greece, um, arguably uh, one of the main ceremonies, the Eleusinian mysteries that everyone had done, everyone who was anyone had done, most of them, you know, a lot of major <laughs> philosophers. Um, this was a, a, a secret process where you kind of like lived a myth. And, and part of that process was taking probably a psychedelic. It's kind of debated what it was, but the, the kaikion. So like a possibly kind of LSD related. And it was a profound experience that a lot of people had had, but you didn't talk about it. And you certainly weren't allowed to do it in your home. It was kind of, kind of held off. And so we have this kind of history of substances like this being done in secret, like a kind of, you know, like the Gnostics were also very secret. It's kind of a secret initiation. Thing we can take from that, attitude um and have going on now as we're as we're having the opposite happen as we're having it all explode into the mainstream is there any of that you know what can we take from the wisdom tradition and where where a lot of this stuff came from i mean i think i think the first and strongest is that those experiences were highly acculturated they they were in they were part of long-standing lineage traditions that persisted for dozen generations and generations i mean the Eleusinian mysteries arguably persisted for over two thousand years which is mind-bending because that, that's, that's the rise and fall of different empires, different rulers, different power systems, different cultures, different languages, different everybody's. And somehow that flame kept going, which is astonishing for persistence and anti-fragility. And definitely, you know, secret, secret on pain of death, right? And, and within a living and vibrant religious tradition. So I think that often, 
again, I mean, well-intentioned idealist in the psychedelic space may say, hey, the, 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 the original sin is charging for things, right? Like it's that, the moment you have commerce around a spiritual right, that's, that's the, the rot that sets in. And you can absolutely make that case because that's the seed of pulling in market dynamics. And on the other hand, if you look back in ancient traditions, you always, you always made offerings to the shaman. You always made offerings to the priest or to the temple. So there has always been a value exchange. So the question is what and how, and what are the sign, what are the sort of symbols and indicators of that exchange? What, what sort of relationship does it predicate? What reciprocity does it require? What is fungible versus non-fungible value exchange? Like maybe I come and help you build your house, wise elder, or maybe we, you know, maybe whatever, we, we, we give you the bounty of our garden, however it's done. So there's, there's that question, which is, is it possible in the modern cash economy to have an exchange over what is ultimately and potentially an ineffable and sacred initiatory experience compared to a clinical medical treatment so that just that differentiation, because the moment you've even done that, you've typecast the recipient of those compounds. Because in one, they're a congregant. And then the role of a minister is to oversee their flock, right? And, and their, their duty is to be shepherding the soul, the ensoulment of their congregants. If you are a patient, right? Then you have, then you have, you are a receipt, you know, you're under phys physician's care and your job is to be rendered back above, you know, to, to, to the tyranny of the zero, back to normal. And if you are a venture firm running one of these for-profit things, then you've got a customer and the goal of a customer is lifetime recurring revenue and margin. And each of the same person having the same interior experience or more to the point, having the same pharmacological experience their interior experience and how they are managed and how they are related to through that experience, wildly different. And so, so my sense is, is that the, the pharmacological model, which again, I mean, that was a decision that, that Maps and, and uh, Hefter and others you know, made back in the day, which was let's try and get this to mainstream legal credibility, was a, was a great strategy with unintended consequences, which is that it made it through that 30 year laborious funnel to just get spat out into the waiting arms of big farmer in BC. And then that has all sorts of implications that I don't think anybody was intending as, as, they, took, as they took that path <laughs> versus Native American church versus Santo Daime versus anyone who is pursuing the Supreme Court kind of legal justification of religious rights, right, which has a very, very different set of choice points and a very, very different set of outcomes, not without their own problems, but just a very different pathway as far as kind of collapsing the waveform of like, hey, psychedelics and human transformation, good, <laughs> you know, and like more people need it, yay, and then oops, unintended consequences. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a nice segue into something we, we touched on earlier, which was the life coaches at Matt Johnson stuff. And, you know, on the it's it's complex, like on the topic of of payment, et cetera. You know, I, I do work with synthesis and I, I uh, work at those those retreats. And I have. Yeah, I personally have no problem with um, someone having the agency to decide to pay for an experience if it's held with integrity. That's the key thing. And so this is the kind of the, the, the fulcrum that I keep coming back to. It's. Who's doing it? What are the intentions? Where's the transparency? Where's the honesty? Um, and I have like a bugbear around the word psychedelic wellness, which is something Ronan Levy was talking about in the in the rise of psychedelic capitalism. And I, you know, it, it's not so much the idea of people taking psychedelics not for medical reasons that I'm totally cool with. You know, um, and I'm, I don't mind there being places for people to do that. But there's something around the word wellness that feels kind of off to me, um, which I, I'm. <laughs> not quite sure what it is, but then also that kind of links into this whole, you know, what we were talking about before, this influx of, of life coaches and all sorts of different practitioners who are now suddenly weren't there kind of 20 years ago, but now have come up, come out of the woodwork. I'd love to circle back to this, this point you were raising about people projecting their own thing into the experience. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, it's, you know, it's, it's the Johnny come lately, no question about it. And, and, um, and it's that notion of sort of angels and moths are both drawn to the light. So, so what we see, and, and, and again, our, our friend uh, Jordan um, Hall has, has you know, pithily kind of framed this up. He says any, any kind of edgy or progressive transformational movement, 
right? Going back to Studio 54 or Warhol's Factory or things like Burning Man, or you could apply it to the psychedelic renaissance as well. You start out with the artists, the deeply committed fringe, right? Populations who are just doing the outlier thing because of love of it, can't not, whatever it would be. Then you end up with the, um, the patrons, right? So there are folks with cultural capital and potentially economic capital, and they have a keen eye for what's next. Right. And so, you know, in, in Burning Man, as an example, that would be like the, the uh, Larry Page, the Sergey Brin's, the Elon Musk's. Right. So, so they had influence in Silicon Valley, but they were early adopters of the emergent movement, which was fundamentally warehouse folks in Oakland and anarchists and punk rockers and all this kind of stuff. But they're like, hey, that's fucking rad. Let's add some let's add some resources, energy signal and even let's just be enthusiasts and participants. But after that, <laughs> the next crew to twig on are the sociopaths the connies right the connies are there not for any dying love of the thing but they realize it's it's hot and it has pull and so they position themselves as carnival barkers come on come one come all right come on over here i'll pss, 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 right and this is a little bit like pinocchio being led to pleasure island right and then the final crew to arrive are the tourists they can't fucking tell the difference. They don't know an artist from, from a con if they got hit upside the head with it. And they are massively naive and undereducated or informed about their choices. But the sociopaths are presenting it, whether that's a turnkey camp at Burning Man or, you know, or, you know, personal transformation for psychedelic wellness in a, in a package for six easy installments or whatever it would be. And that that pattern just seems to happen. So what we're seeing in the piling into psychedelic wellness, psychedelic coaching, medicine retreats, all of these things is a bunch of fuckwits coming into a business. They have no de depth or understanding. I mean, it's like if you, if you first came across ayahuasca from a fucking podcast, you know, and now you're holding anything to do with it from the, from the leadership side, you know, just fuck off, you know, and, and, and that sense of utter lack of depth, utter lack of experience or respect or appreciation for the lineage, Western or indigenous, no understanding of the ethics of right, of, of right relationship to the therapeutic role and a complete blurring of your own boundaries because you're probably still in the hockey stick curve of your own deep dive into novelty and sensation seeking. You know, you are, you are absolutely um, part of the problem. And so what we see is A, and I mean, I've seen more than I care to count, number of new clinics, new wellness retreats, and, and, and suddenly people who have had no prior professional background or training or experience are not only offering medicine retreats and workshops, they're offering entire like schools of life, you know, sexuality, relationships, fine, like they've just gone hog wild in their, in their confidence as to what is their zone of expertise. And then you ask them, how, uh, how are you funding this? How are you standing this up? Like what's going on? Oh, well, we're raising all of our money from, in, in medicine ceremonies. So you're getting a bunch of naive overcapitalized seekers, right? With, with extra money in their pockets who are getting self-selected for high dollar psychedelic retreats by Connie's who are, who are representing more than they can deliver, getting them in tripping balls, pair bonding, no boundaries, no true consent, and opening their wallets to fund, oh my gosh, this is the next best thing. This is going to save the world and you guys are going to do it. And then at the same time, and this is what now brings us to Matt Johnson's critique. Um, at the same time, these folks are so sloppy in their epistemology and their sense making about what this all means. What do these non-ordinary states mean? How do they interact with our waking psychology, our roles and responsibilities, and even what are our, interpret our ontological interpretations of the wild ass shit we see out there? And they come back spewing some gobbled mishmash of, of a new age pastiche of magical thinking and then holding forth like that's fucking reality. And then they're imprinting that onto their patients, clients, whatever it is with no shame, no self-awareness. And they're just puking and contaminating the experience of these naive recipients into a, a, a worldview that is absolutely just lousy with viruses and bugs. And now these people in these super susceptible states are having these tearing experiences between their prior worldviews and realities. And now what they think is actually going on, like, oh, we're all star beings or, oh, we're the next nation who's going to vibrate to the fifth density or, oh, you've just contacted your holy guardian angel or, you know, like fill in the blank ad infinitum. And so Maddie and I actually had this conversation because we were standing up a project for Hopkins on PTSD and breathwork. 
and it was going to be deeply within the holotropic tradition. And Stan Groff is, is an emeritus advisor to the project. And even in that, right, even in just hyperventilatory holotropic breathwork and the, the idea that we were going to be wanting this to be able to be interoperable with the Veterans Administration and working with you know, military service people who had suffered PTSD, that we wanted to be able to, we kind of had a, 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 a set of agreements or affiliations with some really wonderful um, NGOs in South America in Africa and in India to be working with child populations, you know, who are coming out of refugee camps, who are coming out of war-torn areas, all sorts of things. That's just getting in the way of vibrancy, living and learning. So we're like, okay, so we can't even actually port into this study the epistemological framework that Stan developed for over 30 years in holotrop holotropic, which is perinatal and prenatal matrices, past life regressions, all these kind of things. You're like, hey, that, because he's, Stan was coming in from the transpersonal psychological methodology. He was divining and de determining what the data was and what it looked like for them through the 70s and through the 80s and through, you know, predicated with shit piles of Sandoz finest in the 60s, right? So they were, they were out there on a raggedy edge of a specific discipline. That discipline doesn't necessarily intersect with where Matt's been coming from in the neuroscientific Hopkins side. And it certainly doesn't intersect with a cross-cultural framework that could work in Catholic South America, that could work in, you know, that could work in Hindu or, or, or polytheistic India, that could work in indigenous or tribal Africa. And you can, because then you run into a situation where let's say, and we, we can use these as I would say analogs, but like even if we just stick with this breathwork experience, you provide somebody a three hour or a weekend session. And wouldn't you know it, it actually works. It does all the things you're hoping for, right? They break down, they have shuddering traumatic releases, they have profound insights, they have some um, access to information that has been repressed, buried, or, 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 um, or, or sort of encoded into their system that now is available for them to make sense of. And you guide them through a worldview, an interpreting lens that is incompatible with the stakeholders in their world, their friends, their family, their, their ministers, their schooling, their professional responsibilities, whatever it would be. And so now you get this upside down effect where the more profound and transformative the experience is, but if you've given them, if you've just you know, bolted on without their knowledge or consent or understanding a specific epistemological framework that is non-interoperable with their world they go back to, you can actually massively re-traumatize them because then they go back and suddenly they are now at odds. What, what did you join a cult? Did you lose your fucking mind? Are you, have you been possessed by a devil? Like fill in the blank, right? But you are no longer of us making sense with us about what that meaningful experience was. So you create this schizoid break between the way I used to make sense of the world and the way I'm now being told the world makes sense. And so Matt's point in that article, I think, was, you know, he, I mean, he, he sent it to me. And I was like, fuck yeah, dude. I totally, and I pulled the paragraph out. I was like, this right here. The fact that untutored, underinformed facilitators, whether that's sanctioned and certified or underground and self appointed, are quite often smuggling in their own muddy ontologies without anywhere near sufficient respect for let the mystery stay the mystery. Our goal is to provide scaffolding and structures for people's own sense-making and meaning-making and development. And, our, and the best thing is to practice pathological restraint, right? What we've seen, what we think it all is, all those kind of things is, is not only um, less than relevant, it's actively counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> I've seen it happen properly. And Jamie, I would love to, to talk for several hours on this. I mean, there's just so much more. Um, but yeah, I think you've laid out. Yeah, I think you've laid it out really brilliantly. So yeah, thanks for taking the time. For sure, man. Since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, we've been thinking about how to create spaces for people to have new kinds of conversations around big ideas, which is why we've just launched our digital campfire, which is a central place for people to gather, to find the others, and to make sense together. It's a place to practice the skills we talk about on the channel. So we have regular sessions that help us improve our sense making and also tap into our collective intelligence. And it's all hosted on a discussion platform called Circle, where you can have conversations around our films and articles, 
or on any other topic you're interested in. We've designed it all to be participatory, so you can set up real-time conversations by creating a crew to dive deeper into different topics or practices. So we've got three different levels of membership, Wise Rebel, Explorer, and Sensemaker. All three levels have access to the digital campfire on Circle. And the Explorers also have access to the following official Rebel Wisdom Run sessions. So on Mondays, we have live sense making, which is a session where we come together to discuss a hot cultural topic. And then on Tuesdays, we have our academy sessions where we have some of the best facilitators in the world teaching various skills. So for example, collective intelligence practice, facilitation training. Then on Thursday, we have our connection gym. And the sense makers are also invited to our Wednesday sessions, which alternates between Q&A and the wisdom gym. The Q&A is with one of the stars of our films and will often go up on the channel itself. And the Wisdom Gym is where we bring in some of the biggest names in transformation and growth to share their practices with us. Within Circle, we've also included a number of resources that we found useful. So sense-making tools, meditations, authentic relating games, and guides for how to host your own session. So the most important thing to remember is that this is an experimental space and is designed to be participatory. So it's really your space to come in and make your own. So we'd love to see you there.